The Earth's continents are riddled by faults. Tectonic structures like the Great Glen Fault that carves across Scotland. Or, on the other side of the world, South Island, New Zealand, the Alpine Fault, the Dead Sea Fault Zone. Both are well-known structures, but others are perhaps less well-known to the public. Google Earth is a great resource for exploring faults across the planet's surface, like these spectacular structures in Iran. We can use the offset of features across faults to estimate apparent displacements, at least from a plan view perspective. But we need to be careful. So this is a film with a cautionary tale. Consider the dramatic fracture zones that lie on offsets along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's tempting to think that the ridge has been offset, displaced by faults like this, but that's wrong. The faults are intimately related to the seafloor spreading processes and are jogs of the ridge system. So the rocks moved like this across the faults. You can find out more about these transform faults and how they work on another video on the Shear Zone channel. So the message is that in order to understand fault zones, we need to understand the geology around them as well. And what's true for the oceans is also true for the continents. A great place to tell a cautionary tale is here, amongst the mountains formed by the collision between India and the rest of Asia. Tectonics that continue today. On the edge of the Tian Shan Mountains, this is the Pikiang Fault. It's dramatic. And across the internet, you can find studies that do this. Animations that put the fault offsets back, restoring the landscape, and then offset it again. And on this basis, we might measure the apparent displacement on the Pikiang Fault, its sense and magnitude. But the assumption here is that the broken ridge line with all its stripy layers originally formed a continuous feature. Well, let's look at the geology around the Pikiang Fault and consider what the geological structure is of those ridges. These strata are really distinctive. So let's give them some ages. Over on the right are buff colored Cambro Division carbonates deposited in shallow water. And these are overlain by deeper marine Silurian rocks, those dramatic teal colors. And then in turn by the Devonian red beds, continental sediments. The boundaries are distinctive with beds dipping off to the north as shown by these symbols. These sedimentary rocks have been tilted and folded. In this case, they have a symmetrical pattern. The rocks are getting younger this way and on the north side, the mirror image. The rocks dip in, defining a synform the sequence, a syncline, like this, seen in cross-section. So the low ground is a synform. The ridges relate to antiforms, anticlines bringing up the older rocks to outcrop, with the syncline, the younger rocks between. So let's add some other stratal dips and look more clearly at the ridges, the place we started. Rocks getting younger to the north inclined in that direction. But the south side of this ridge doesn't have the younger strata. So this isn't just a simple anticline. And we can draw a cross section across it to show the structure. This is the basic information and the missing strata on the south side, that's on the right, suggests this structure the ridge is carried up 
on a thrust fault. So the south side of this ridge is marked by a thrust. We can use the same approach to map out other thrusts across the area, identifying first the dipping strata and then adding the thrust fault traces like this. So the Pikiang fault lies within a thrust system which has created the antiforms, those ridges. We can step back and show the broader context. And the Pikiang fault isn't the only structure that lies oblique to the thrust faults. These broadly north-south faults are an integral part of the thrust belt, dividing it up into compartments or corridors which have different thrust fault spacings and maybe complex sequences of thrust development. And this uncertainty makes determining displacements on the Pikiang Fault and others like it by no means straightforward. We might be being misled by the simplicity of the landscape features. A good way of illustrating this is to make a physical model by just laying out some little wooden tiles like this. You could use dominoes and just lay them out like this on a flat surface. Looking down on our experiment, we have two corridors that will make thrust faults separated by a north-south Pikiang fault. We can create our thrust ridges like this and then by activating the Pikiang fault later, carve them with a left lateral offset which is consistent with the standard interpretation of the Pikiang Fault. But let's explore an alternative. Thrusts could form in a more complicated pattern, relaying across the line of the Pikiang Fault. This can again first off generate a left lateral displacement, but if more thrusts form like this, the sense of movement on our Pikiang Fault switches its sense so changing the thrusting history in each of our corridors makes for a different history of displacement on the Pikiang Fault, even making patterns with no net offsets. So in this analysis, it's the sequence of thrusting in each of these corridors that controls the activity and defines how the Pikiang Fault moves, what its sense of movement is, and its offset. And indeed there's evidence from the stratigraphy, the sequence of rocks on either side of the Pikiang fault, that the fault line itself was there long before the thrusting. For more information and documentation of the Pikiang fault's early history and role in compartmentalizing the thrust belt, check out this paper by Sebastian Turner and co-workers. It's great. The Pikiang Fault is a beautiful structure, but it might not be quite as simple as first seems. And that's a salutary lesson for doing structural geology from satellite images alone. So Google Earth, a really great tool for exploring faults in our landscapes. But just be careful when analysing those faults to place the faults in the context of the surrounding geology and the other tectonic structures in the neighbourhood. I've been Rob Butler and thank you very much for watching this short film.